Hi, welcome everybody and welcome to our 32nd Open Pot Club. I forgot to uh, change the waiting room uh, in, uh, notice from the um, Festival of Ideas, so apologies for that. But anyway, you're here. Great to see you all, as, as always. Brilliant. Um, and as always, we've had a super busy horological week. In fact, we've had a bit of a crazy horological day, um, 24... <laughs> feels like 24 7 business at the moment which is brilliant so thank you all for your contributions um we're going to um continue something that came out of facebook actually today that ties in with something we've been doing talking about all week which is uh, a sort of community uh vote on how we should repair something uh soft sold it was something came up today which is really cool because it linked in with um, our conversations, not only about French clocks that you see here, but also about train counts and phase relationship of striking work. And I mentioned this a bit, but I thought we could go into it a bit more depth. Now, there's a few things sort of queuing up, waiting to be uh, discussed. Um, oh, before we get going, of course, um, our usual uh, notice, notification, that these sessions are recorded and they will be lodged on our uh, YouTube channel archive. So please, if you want to remain anonymous, then keep your camera turned off. Otherwise, it would be brilliant to hear from you in the live chat. Uh, as always, we've got Team Open Clock Club, uh, who's um, typing away already, I can hear. Uh, so half the deal here is that you join in, tell us where you're from, what you've been working on, and uh, ask questions as well. Um, so I'll try and answer questions as we go along. So yeah, we've got quite a few things in the wings at the moment. You might remember, I think it was last week, um, we'd had a request to talk about fusy clock springs. And so I went online and bought a fusy clock, uh, which then didn't turn up because the uh, vendor uh, had made a mistake with the postage and they wouldn't post it and I offered to pay it anyway. So that was that. So I quickly bought another one, which will be here any day now. So we will talk about that next week. Um, fusy clock springs, but also fusy clocks in general, how you let the power down and that kind of stuff, which is quite interesting. And also, uh, I don't quite remember when it was, um, but we had a conversation about silvering dials, which just pop our little ponjo out of the way. Now, I was really reluctant to talk about silvering. Uh, how should I put this, being diplomatic, because I don't really want to encourage people to do it per se. Uh, oh, Devashi just missed the notification about the fusey clock. Anyway, um, you'll see it in the live chat, maybe. Uh, so um, silvering dials is really interesting because in theory, silvering uh, a brass dial like this is an additive process. You put material on. However, um, there's a lot of practice out there which uh, involves kind of scrubbing the dial down first with abrasive paper. So I've always pushed back on the idea of demonstrating silvering, but um, push has come to shove. And so I'm going to do it. I'm going to start doing it on some tokens and um, then I'm going to uh, work on a, a bit of this um, 18th century or early 19th, no, it's 18th century, isn't it? Uh, just zoom out a wee bit and see the chaos that's surrounding the bench at the moment. Uh, 18, late 18th century brass uh, long case clock uh, chapter ring, which again I got from the internet. And um, you can see here, something's gotten spilled on the dial. I wish I knew what that was, because it's actually done quite a good job of removing the lacquer. Um, it's actually melted the wax here. You can see the wax has melted, but it's re-hardened. So um, and then another little bit of corrosion here. So there's a whole conversation to be had here, which I'm sure you'll love to join in, our kind of pseudo-philosophical conversa con uh, conversation. Um, and in the old days, people used to say, I mean, I can't get into it now because my brain's already going to explode, but um, it's not how it was when it was made. It's putting it back as original. It's what the maker intended, all those kind of conversations, which I think we're sort of past a little bit now. But anyway, however, um, I do get there's a point 
in some circumstances where you would want to, let's call it refresh the silvering. And so that's what we're going to do. And you will be amazed. I guarantee you, you will be amazed at how this um, dial gets refreshed. A really good argument to leave it as it is. People often say, well, you can't read the thing. I say, well, why does that matter? Why do we need to read what time it is? You know, that's like, anyway, um, being controversial as always. So silvering, I think it'll be, I'd really um, get some people very excited and it'll probably annoy some people as well. So apologies in advance. Uh, but that's not for today, alas, that's just to wet your whistle for the weeks to come. Um, so yeah, fusey clock springs and letting down the power on a fusey clock. I'm gonna try and get two clocks. I think the one that's coming is a line fusey, uh, but it'd be also nice to um, demonstrate a chain fusey as well. So um, what happened? Okay, I thought I would try one of these kind of community conservation questions and it was really cool. And the question was, we'll come back to this in a second. Um, here we've got a French clock bezel. We saw some of this last week and uh, usual thing, cables everywhere. Cable management is uh, leaves something to be desired. We've got a French clock bezel, and you can see if you've never seen one of these before, how it works is the mechanism goes in here uh, with the dial, obviously, and then the whole thing is kept in tension in the case by two screws that come through from a case back type bezel, and uh, that holds the whole thing uh, in in the case. And you can see here, which is often the case one of the straps has broken. So my question to the Facebook group was, uh, and somebody kindly did put it into a kind of questionnaire because I couldn't quite do that, is what do we do about this? And I gave four or five different sort of scenarios, uh, things like uh, solder a new bit on here, solder a block on the inside, shorten this bit, um, make a completely new strap. and. To my surprise, A, there were quite a few other um, of others kind of suggestions, one of which was to buy uh, a bezel like this from the internet, take the strap off, uh, fit, uh, fit that new strap. And uh, one was to put a nut on the inside, which I've seen done quite a lot, actually, sold a nut on. But so it went to a vote. And in the end, it was an amazingly close call between making a completely new piece and uh, soldering a bit on the end. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to solder uh, a piece on here. And if we get time, we're going to tap it like this at the end. We'll come back to that in a, in a minute. So on the theme of French clocks, on, earlier today, somebody kindly uh, posted, if we can just, um, I might take my gloves off. Oh no, it's focused. Somebody really kindly uh, posted a picture of a clock not dissimilar to this one. And they said um, something like, where can I get a new wheel? Because the camp wheel here, not the locking plate, but you can call it the locking plate if you like, but it doesn't do any locking. Um, maybe it causes locking to be done. Maybe that's it anyway. Uh, had been altered by somebody. Some of these um, stations, let's call them, had been uh, changed or filed or new bits sold on, and it's obviously not working properly. So let's dig into why that is and what you would do about it. Now, of course, on this um, uh, How to Repair Pendulum Clocks, we talk a lot about the Smith's Enfield single train clock and the two train clock because um, they're a great place for people to begin. And one of the, gr the great advantages of those 20th century clocks is if you get really, really stuck, um, you can borrow parts from other clocks because to a degree they're interchangeable. Now these clocks, these Pondule de Paris, although they may look very similar, are not interchangeable. The chance of you, you probably saw last week, we've got a box of these things, uh, the chance of you've been able to take a count wheel from another clock and fit it on here and it work, is actually remarkably slim. And always what I would say is try and retain as much um, so-called original material as possible. That's one about my sort of um, the premise under which I operate. And the reason for that is, is you might argue, well, that thing doesn't mean anything as it is. There are thousands of these. But of course, 
we don't know. Um, we don't know what we don't know. We don't know what stories might come out of these things. And it's sod's law that you change something and then the next minute you'll realize that um, that actually was something that was quite interesting. I remember, I won't embarrass the person by telling them, but um, they, we were doing, actually talking about dial resilvering. There was some dial re-waxing going on and the boss of this clock, you know, the thing in the arch, it's got the maker's name on it or Tempest Fugit or whatever, was filled with red wax. And this person said, oh, these are never filled with red wax. That's later. You know, nowadays I would push back on it, but then I was young and um, so on. So I didn't. And then literally the next day, somebody brought another clock in with the same. And it was just like, yeah, just leave it. Leave it as it is. Anyway, so we're going to try and retain um, this count wheel. And the reason is you could get another one and the chances are it probably wouldn't work. And so you either make a brand new one or you try and rescue the one that's there. So how do we do that? Well, um, let's just start with a question slightly before that. Why did it ever get changed or filed or sold in the first place? And of course, we don't know. We could conjecture. But I think the reason why is because it was set up incorrectly or somebody maybe didn't understand um, how you set the thing up. Now I'm looking for the hammer. And um, they got into a kind of panic over the whole thing. So just let's watch this. So remember, we've been talking about phase relationship of striking trains and the importance of doing uh, a train count. If you're beginning, I bet, even if you're not beginning, I would always advise you do a train count. So let's just step back a second. This clock has got two trains, okay? The train is the name that clocks people give to the gears, the gearboxes, if you like. The one on the right here is for the going, so that's for the time side of the clock, uh, and that terminates here in this escape wheel, which uh, is part of our escapement, um, driving the oscillator, the pendulum. And then the other train, which is mainspring, must remember to keep it in the picture, mainspring inside this barrel, which is integral with this great wheel, drives an intermediate wheel, which uh, you can just about see, a pointy stick, there it is, just about see lurking in there. And the intermediate wheel arbor has got the count wheel um, squared onto it. So there's a square here. Again, we were talking about this last week, weren't we? The intermediate wheel drives this wheel here, uh, our pin wheel, so that lifts the hammer, which drives this wheel, which is our stop wheel, which drives this wheel, which is our warning wheel, which drives the fly, uh, which regulates the speed at which the striking train runs. Um, and yeah, wind a little bit. The, um, the challenges to the clockmaker when you've taken this thing apart and cleaned it is that there's this very specific phase relationship between some of these components. So let's just watch it striking now. Okay, so in the live chat, as quick as you like, what has happened? Let's just make it happen again. First one to get the answer gets a special prize, which I don't know what it is, but... Um, What's the question? What's going on here? What's wrong? We're waiting. I'll do it again. Okay, do it until somebody gets the answer. Derek, number one, it's finished up when it should be down. Well done, Derek. Special gold star there. It is locking on lift. So the train has been locked, stopped uh, before the hammer falls. And this is a really common fault. Well, I shouldn't really call it a fault because it's quite tricky to get it right um, when the, the hammer has been lifted. So let's just have a look here. We're on station number, um, can't even see, two, three, four. I think it might be five, but let's just let it run. So it's all ah, right, there's two things there. Look, it's locked before this detent piece begins to rise up the, the ramp of the count wheel. That's an important point. So 
right? So it struck five, which may be correct, but it went on to, oh, my screen sharing is paused, it says. Well, I can still see the camera. Can you still see the camera? Yeah, it's paused. Right, okay. Why has that happened? Um, so it's, it's okay now. Great. Um, so why is this a problem? Well, it's a big problem because when you're rounding these small numbers, like one and two, there's a chance you can see there's a little bit of, um, actually that engine, no, forget that, uh, that the, you'll get the wrong number of blows struck or it won't strike the final blow. So it'll run and it won't strike, it'll strike at the wrong time um, in relation to the, uh, the rest of the train. So it's important that this phase relationship is correct. Um, and the correct relationship is the very moment the hammer drops, the train should lock. Um, the other problem here is that the, uh, where are we? Here, underneath, if we just look at the, I'll get it so you can see, if you can see in there, just down here, the tail of the hammer is on that lifting pin. It's slightly difficult. So do you see it there wiggling about? Um, so the striking train is already doing work. It's already lifting the hammer when it, when it starts to run. Um, which is a problem because it's got more work to do as it builds up speed. And therefore that first strike either might be slow or it might actually fail to start again. So it's really important, the striking train, it's not just this clock, it's pretty much all clocks like this, locks immediately um, that the hammer's dropped. So I think what's happened, long story short or long story long, I think what's happened is somebody has either assembled this train incorrectly or they've put the count wheel on the wrong square. And I think we, let's just take the hammer off for a second. I think we talked about this last week. It's so easy um, as a beginner in particular, but for anybody to pop that on there like that, think brilliant, put the pin through and um, away you go. But that is problematic because um, again, that will change the, the relationship between this uh, detent here and the notches where the train is going to lock. And so the maker almost always um, marked this in relation to the square. And we're going to try and see it. Yeah. So I'll try and get it in the light for you. If you just look here, get the camera to focus. Um, on this flat of the square, can you see there? There's a little file mark struck across. That mark, if we look on the inside of the count wheel, there's also a file mark, let me just find it. Yeah, there's also a file mark, if I can get it in the light, just try it that way up. There, we can see it now, it's quite subtle. There's a file mark there on the collet. So that file mark and the file mark on the arbor go together when you're assembling the clock. That's rule number one. And I think that's what's happened here, that that hasn't happened probably. The second thing, as I talked about last week, um, and that's to do with the hammer dropping at the correct place. Let's just try it again. Yeah, hammer on lift, um, is that there's a very specific relationship between the count wheel wheel, the intermediate wheel, and the pin wheel here, and the stop wheel here. Well, we've already seen the relationship between the count wheel arbor and the count wheel. So now what we're looking for is a relationship between the pin wheel and the stop wheel here. And I mentioned this last week, but I'll just go through it again, um, is that if we, I'll just try and get it in the light so you can see. Let's let our, um, train run a bit and you can see the pins for the lifting the lifting pins for the hammer but there can you see this badger here there's a little dimple in the rim of the wheel and that dimple in the rim of the wheel must be aligned or engaged with a very specific with a specific uh, leaf of the stop wheel here uh, and this is going to be too subtle to see it, but I'll just let it run around. Might have to do a drawing. 
too much talking. I can, I don't know whether you can see that there. I think it's too small to see. I can just about make it out. But that leaf of the pinion has got the shoulder filed off. So oh, I've got a list of, well, I'll, I'll go through my list later just to check the term. So let's just zoom me out a bit. So here's our um, pinion. Like that. And the um, gosh, anybody would think I've done, I've done that before. So this is uh, the, the flank of the pinion here. And what we've got is um, these uh, pinion leaves are just cut normal. But this one, the corner's been filed off. If you've never seen this before, rush out and find yourself a French clock and you will find it there. And so that dimple on the pinwheel must line up, um, however it goes, something like this, must line up with that, otherwise it won't um, lock correctly. So let's just do that. It is easy to get forget, Ian, you're absolutely right. So good point there from Ian. Um, what we're going to do here, um, and I don't know whether this was made, presumably it was for assembly, let's just zoom back in again, is that the movement back plate and front plate as well here has got these little devices called ponts or bridges, and you can remove them without taking the train um, apart. I never know what the point of the one on centre wheel is, maybe it's just something to do with um, manufacturing the Ebauche or Blanc Roulant system. But the incredibly helpful here, because we can take the pinwheel uh, out of the train, disengage it from this uh, stop wheel here and put it back in the right place. So absolutely right, Ian. Golden rule when you're working on spring-driven clocks is you must let the power off safely before you take the train apart. Now, it's easy to make a mistake here because we're not actually going to part the plates. If you unscrew this and take it out, there will be a mini kind of explosion because the um, all the power from the spring will be released in an instant and, uh, and um, it'll damage something. So as always, we're going to check it back. I assembled this because the clock isn't oiled. It's one I'm using for some writing we're doing uh, with the click the wrong way around here so it can't actually be wound. But on this side, I just whizzed it round today for this purpose of this. So if you're doing this at home, uh, and I won't go off and try and look for them because it's not wound much, but um, no, can't see them. Anyway, normally I would put my safety glasses on, particularly if it's uh, uh, more wound than this. So using a letdown key, and I know a lot of people like using the key of the clock and a bit of wood or something with a slot cut across but I still find that that's a little bit unstable and it can catch in your fingers. So my advice is to either buy a set of letdown keys like this or to make one, and I did a video on it, but anyway, um, and let the power off the spring. So we take the power and depressing the tail of the ratchet click, very slowly allow the arbor to rotate. You can do it if you're a beginner, just do it one click at a time or a few teeth. Um, and then when it's let off, double, triple check that the train is not under any power and the going train as well. So it's now safe to remove that pond. Again, is it? Oh. Why is the kid doing that? Right, sorry about that. I don't know why it keeps doing that. Um, so um, we've let we've safely let off the power from both trains. So we can now remove this little pond or bridge. Um, now I'm not going to be able to find a an actual screwdriver that actually fits. Terrible screwdriver, don't look. Maybe can't show you that screwdriver. It's uh, should be made illegal. Some 
Go look, go look, go look. Some really grim electrician screwdriver. I'm just sharpening the um, screwdriver because the slot in the screw is quite uh, shallow and narrow. You didn't see that screwdriver, okay. Can you repeat that last step that you did when the screen was frozen? Oh, uh, was that about letting the power off? I think so. Right, okay, so just make sure, um, let's just get that out of the way, that using a mainspring letdown tool like this, um, I don't know whether you got this or not, but some people use the a clock's own key and a bit of wood or something with a slot cut in it. I'm not a major fan of that. I think it can get you out of a hole or if you're already quite experienced, that's great. But with the key, um, the lobes of the key sticking out, I always find they seem to get in the way. So for me, I would go for a, a, a letdown tool like this and they come in a set. They're kind of quite expensive. There's the rest of the um, arbors there. Fit in like this double-ended things. So they're quite good. Um, I got There's a video on my channel of how to make one out of a clock key. Anyway, so you must make sure that both trains are completely let down, otherwise you're gonna have a mini explosion on your hands. But you can see now, um, a little bit there, um, we've got our pont off, and these are marked, by the way. Um, they're not interchangeable. Again, this one, you can see underneath, it's got, uh, some punch marks there, manufacturer. I think they're manufacturer's punch marks. They're actually batch number, but they're not interchangeable. You can't put that one on there and vice versa. So make a note in your day book of, um, of where they go. So, but you can see now we can lift out our um, pinwheel. In fact, I won't take it completely out, but it's independent of the train. And you may imagine that if we hadn't let the power off the mainspring, now we will be looking around for parts and trying to find somebody to repivot our wheel. So I'm just going to align that dot mark with that um, pinion leaf that's cut off. So I'm going to have to look a bit closer. Matthew, um, Derek says let down tools are not expensive if you buy half a set, a half set. All right, okay, yeah. And it's just one of those things. I mean, I've had that set for, oh God, I don't know, 20 years. Um, so it's like completely a uh, good value for money, really. Right, okay. So buy them as you need them. Yeah. Now you can see why. Can the camera see what you're doing? No. Oh, just see the bench. I know. Um, it's not. I'll, I'll demonstrate in a sec, I'm just trying to learn. They can't see anything. No, no. Mm. So the, um, what I'm trying to do here is I, um, I can't see, <laughs> sorry, the way I, is to move the pinwheel here by lifting it, disengaging it from the pinion that it's driving, move it round and re-engage it. So that dot mark there is married up or engages with the pinion leaf here that's cut, uh, cut away. So I'm afraid I'm going to have to, uh, leave you for a second while I do that because I um, I need to look through my eyeglass so I'm really sorry about that. It's not a pretty sight anyway. You're not missing much. It is incredibly subtle in this case because the maker has just kind of. almost grazed the pinion with their file. They haven't actually really filed a whole lot away. Usually it's a little bit more obvious than this. 
bit of a faff. A total buff. Right, I think that's it. Let's try it. So what I've done is I've lifted this wheel here, the pinwheel, out of engagement with the stop wheel pinion, moved it around a little bit, re-engaged it, done that about six times until I think I've got it in the right place. Uh, and let's refit this pond, this little bridge. It needs, um, I think it was uh, Derek last week who reminded people that these pivots on these clocks are incredibly hard. They're hardened, unlike the uh, Smith's Enfield ones that are soft, which can help, but they're also relatively easy to break off, particularly the ones, um, uh, the ones further up the train. So that is the world's worst screwdriver, I must say, even by my standards, even by my low standards. So let's try it. Wind it a bit. I think it's probably gone back in exactly the same place. Or maybe not. Great. Okay, so let's just put the hammer back on and I will demonstrate, you'll see the difference now. A little bit of a wind. And when we lift up the count wheel dent, the train, just move it around so you can see it there, stops immediately once the hammer has dropped. So um, two really important points there. One is to check the relationship between the count wheel and uh, the square on which it sits. The second thing is to check the relationship between the um, pinwheel and the stock wheel pinion. The third thing now, I won't do it because otherwise we won't get anything else done, is we would now look at the relationship between the warning flag here, which is on the back of the warning piece there, and the warning pin. And what we want is about a quarter to a half or a third to a half of run to warning. And the reason we want some run to warning, if we just put our count wheel back on again, is if you don't have, well, if you have no run to warning, the pin, the warning pin, and the warning flag can actually butt up against one another like that. But the other thing, if there isn't enough run to warning, then the striking train doesn't have enough time to advance on the longer numbers, and it can just relock after one. So what you would get is you'd get the like the half hour striking, and then you would get another half, and then the, the, the striking would be out of sync. So you typically need about one third to one half run to warning. I'll have a quick look. And I think we're, no, it's on the wrong side. So um, at the moment, the warning pin is all the way up here by the fly and the warning flag is here. And if we look at when we run to warning, the warning wheel has to rotate eight tenths of a revolution. So um, four fifths of a revolution. So too much run to warning there. So what we would now do, I won't do it now, is to take the power off again, take the plate pin out and very gingerly disengage the warning pinion from the stop wheel, move that round a few uh, leaves and re-engage it and try it again. So there's a whole process working your way up through the train to get the phase relationship correct. Um, but this is all kind of uh, good stuff, I hope, because once you know that these marks are there and you know how to do it, you just save yourself such a lot of pain. Is that a question, Rachel? Yeah, from Matthew Condon. Yeah. He's looking at one of his own adventure movements. Yeah. He said the dimple on the pinwheel 
was lined up with a tooth on the wheel and not the space between teeth. Right, okay. The leaf on the meshing pinion is filed. Yeah. Should the pinion leaf be positioned before or after the tooth with the dimple? This that's a really good uh, question, Matthew. That the, the sometimes the positioning of that dimple on the pinwheel is really indistinct, and it is on this one as well. Um, so uh, the, the person who put the dimple there kind of wasn't particularly bothered. Uh, so you're going to have to try it in both positions. I don't think there's a rule of thumb. You're going to have to try it in one bef one leaf before and one leaf after to find out which one it is, then make a note in your day book for if you repair that clock again. But um, yeah, I've seen that a lot. And this again is quite indistinct that the dimples near a tooth are not near um, a gap. So I don't think there's a rule of thumb. If there is, then uh, please let me know. I think they're meant to be aligned. So what we've got now is hammer back on. And we've got a, that's half an hour. Not massively convinced that's actually quite right, but um, there we go. So we saw the count wheel deton drop after the um, the, the uh, into the notch, and then the hammer dropped, and then the train locked pretty much straight away. So that kind of looks okay. I'd want to test this and test this time and time again to be sure it's absolutely right. Just a couple of things here before we uh, move on is that the uh, square here is broken off. Look where the pin went through. If you want to know how to do this to make this repair, look on our live stream channel because it's exactly what we did on Thursday, but with a gathering uh, gathering wheel. Now I'm just going to have to close the blind because I forgot that it's actually sunny out there. So we'll be safe. OK, so the question then is, if this count wheel is in the case of the one on Facebook, have a look. A couple of these stations have been fiddled with and filed and soft soldered. What on earth do you do to correct it? Luckily, I think most of them are OK. Let's say nine are OK and three have been fiddled with. Um, what you do is get a bit of brass. Here's an old uh, clock plate, bit of a French clock plate. And you can see I've scribed on here two radii one that represents the lower step of the count wheel and one that represents the upper step of the count wheel here. It's about a millimeter. Saw this here and file it. So it's a really good fit on there. And as we're gonna see in a minute, uh, I hope, um, soft solder that onto the edge of the count wheel. Um, just like there's a video again, I did of a snail for a clock by Henry Hindley of York. It's on the YouTube channel. Exactly like that. So you're basically soldering on a new piece of material, and then you check that the uh, count wheel works on all these stations. And then you use the count wheel to actually kind of mark the new material. So you let the train run really slowly until it just locks, or it would just lock if there was a gap there. You put a tiny mark and you begin to file away. And of course, because you're removing material, new material, it actually works really well because you can just take a bit more off, try it, a bit more off and try it. And that way you can rescue this wheel, just like I rescued that snail um, on, the, uh, on the YouTube channel. So for the uh, Facebook person that's got the clock like this, then um, look at that video. I can put a link to it in the description here and uh, it'll demonstrate how you rebuild this, but you use the clock to mark the wheel, if that makes sense. Uh, and by doing it that way, you can absolutely uh, rescue this thing. The only thing before we move on is that um, sometimes the knife edge here wears, a bit like warm pallets, don't file the knife edge away. Because all that happens then is that the uh, locking face here of the locking piece then moves down. And if you look at it now, let's go back a bit. Uh, there we are. There isn't a whole lot of gap already. There's probably only about half a millimeter. 
So if you file the knife edge down, this drops down, and then you um, are in the situation where the train doesn't run properly or it locks some time when it shouldn't do when you're in more of a mess filing and bending. And then people bend this down, this face. And the problem with that is that, back to another quick drawing. Um, yeah, by bending and filing, always bad news. Add material on. So we've got our locking face here. This locking face is a radius, okay, from this point, an equal radius. So if you begin to bend this whole thing down, um, it's going to be like that in relationship, in relation to how it was originally. So our locking pin, which is traveling in this direction, comes along, lands on the face of the locking piece, and rather than that locking face being radial, it's now got some kind of impulse on it. And you get the situation where it knocks the locking piece out of the way. So the train runs again, customer rings up, that clock you repaired, it's not working properly, it keeps striking 373. Um, and the same thing, if you bend it that way, sorry, wrong color. If you bend the locking face the, the other way, then when the clock is running up to striking, it's got more work to do in pushing the whole striking train backwards. So that knife edge, don't file it. If you have to do anything, add material on. Okay, like just like the pallets. Right. Gosh. Um, very happy to do more on French clocks at some point. Uh, there will be a short course on French clocks, uh, hopefully before Christmas, but um, yeah. Okay. Sometimes the tent wears and can affect striking. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, Ian. The detent. Don't file the detent. Put material on, like refacing and gathering pallet. Get a piece of steel and solder it onto the face, um, which will mean the stop wheel stops very, very fractionally earlier. But adding material as a rule of thumb is always better than filing or bending or removing material. Okay, so back to our. Um, uh, bezel. So the next thing we've got to do here, we're going to solder this, but just a little top tip about getting the glass out. And that is the, um, the bezel is obviously metal and the glass is glass. So the bezel will expand more and faster than the glass. So if we just use uh, a heat gun without going bonkers, yeah, heat gun. And we just gently heat the bezel. The glass breaks. might be able to get that out. It's loose now. <laughs> yeah, these glasses are really quite thick, but um, nevertheless, it's quite scary. Yeah. Also, we don't want to get it so hot that it damages the lacquer. Oh yeah, no. There we are. There you go. Have faith; it does work. Now I know what's going to happen. The vessel's going to be so hot that I can't touch it. If the, if the glass is uh, cracked but no losses, then what I would do if it's a clean break is while it's still in the bezel, I might repair it. I mean, I would ask a ceramics conservator, but there's a special um, uh, epoxy resin called um, Hextal, H-X-T-A-L, which has got a refractive index. It's very similar to glass. So I might actually be tempted to glue it together or at least tack it together in the bezel and then take it apart, but these glasses are really quite thick. 
And it's not that they can't be broken, but you can see there, it's quite thick. So yeah, I would be tempted to, to heat it and get it out. Um, mm, good question. Don't know, I'll maybe glue it beforehand. Mm, don't know. No, I pushed it out. Yeah, you've got a you're really, really tight fit. I mean, the people that fitted them in the first place obviously had a really great technique for uh, for doing it. But it's a nice way if you want to clean in the bezel or clean the glass as well. Uh, but where we're going to be working on it, it's kind of quite safe, nice to have the, the bezel out. So what I'm going to do, and I've got no idea how we're doing for time, time flies and all that stuff. All right, okay, great got quarter of an hour. So um, I'm going to make a new piece and soft solder it on here. So the, without getting too much into the kind of rationale for it, I wanted to retain as much material as possible. Now, my decision or the decision of the voting group really doesn't mean a whole lot because you have got to make your own decision on the day. And this, of course, is called practice. And it's much, much better fun than actually doing the clock repairs themselves. And don't beat yourself up about practice because tomorrow something will happen that will change. You know, your practice should change and evolve. All you have to do is to be reasonably happy that on the day you made that decision for these very good reasons, whatever that decision is. Um, so, yeah, we could have uh, taken out this rivet, put a completely new bit of metal in, uh, could have done all sorts of things. But I'm going to uh, soft solder a piece on the inside here. So let's just get some material. To do this quite quickly. So we've got our trusty CZ108, which has seemed to be using every single week that's gone by. And the reason I'm using CZ108 is because I want to fold the end of the strap over, okay. Um, CZ120, the leaded brass would probably break. So this is about uh, eight. I'm gonna make it about 10 millimeters, the bit I want to cut off. Um, can you repair a bezel with a full crack all the way through? A bezel or a glass? It says bezel, Matthew's says bezel, but maybe it means glass. If you mean the glass, then yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, it's never going to be invisible, invisible, invisible. But um, yeah, try uh, this for repairing glass. As I said, I would always ask a ceramics conservator, but if you want to repair a glass, Try this epoxy called Hextal, H-X-T-A-L. It's very kind of watery when you mix it up and it runs into the crack. It won't get right into a running crack, but certainly we had some um, kind of like studio glass that was broken and it was all right, wasn't it? It's, you don't notice the repair. The only problem is of course, it's epoxy resin. So it's got a relatively low glass transition temperature. So you can't kind of use it for something that's gonna hold um, hot water, for instance. Bezel. Bezel. Oh, the bezel's cracked. Yeah, you can repair the bezel. The problem with repairing the bezel is you've got to um, decide whether what kind of repairing method you use. And of course, it might be that you, um, if it's a metal bezel, let's just look at this one. I mean, if this was cracked, say where it's joined, I don't know where that might be. I would be tempted first to put a band around it, a band of brass that's heated up and kind of shrunk on because the problem is that you start heating it up maybe you would get away with soft soldering it um there look that's where it's been braised when it was new um but the problem is if you start silver soldering it you're going to lose the finish and then uh that's pretty depressing because this finish is really really beautiful here so for me um if this was cracked let's say it broke there where the braise was what I would do is I would make up a really thin band of brass that was ever so slightly too tight to fit on there. I would heat up the brass, cool this down, and then shrink it on, like shrinking a, a tire on a, a cartwheel, that kind of thing. And that would hold it together and it would be pretty reversible and we wouldn't have to damage the, um, damage the, uh, the finish there. How do you get the glass back in, Matthew? Set a reverse process reverse process. So you um, uh, make sure the glass is cool and the bezel's warm. You fit it together, push it in with a click. The glasses always go back easier than they come out because there's a hundred years of stuff on there that's holding it in. So once you've cleaned the glass, 
and gently cleaned out the, the snap ring with a bit of um, pegwood or something, then they actually usually go in easier. And if it's a bit loose and you find the glass is falling out, then might not change the angle. I was going to change the angle of my camera to piercing saw angle, but it's too much faff, I think. Um, if you find the glass is falling out, then the thing I would use is, have I got it, is this device. Okay, that stuff, which is a, um, a watch uh, crystal cement. And the reason why this is really good is that it comes in a tube with a thing on the end like a mosquito. See that really fine sort of applicator. So you can um, put on a tiny amount before you put the glass in and that will just prevent it from, uh, that'll prevent it from rattling off and falling out, which of course would be a bit of a disaster. So that's uh, top tip of the day. Get some of that really useful. It's watch, it's watch stuff. I'm just gonna quickly sew off uh, some material here. <laughs> Or you can't see. So while we're um, sewing and filing, we can be thinking about the thread. Because in this case, if you can hear me, the um, has gone missing as well as the end of the strap. I know everybody likes to tap and die set, so I'm just going to speak it for it. So there's our bit of material as rough as you like. But anyway, that's that's okay. We've got one squarish end. So I'm just going to uh, file that to get rid of the surface. Now, um, I can't remember what we were making last week, but when you get this material look, it's got um, a guillotined edge, which is not very pleasant. So I'd want to normally get rid of that um, by filing it off. Have I left enough material? Eight point two to eight point nine. So not masses is the answer. <laughs> John's vice back. We've got new vices, by the way, on the way um, that need mounting. So all very exciting there. Can't have too many vices. So let's just. As a demonstration, just tidy that edge up a little bit. And let's just, oh, we don't really need to square up that end, the way we can just bend it around. So this is going to be soft soldered. Now, as we know, soft soldering is a relatively low temperature joining method relatively low temperature and uh, it's great for things like this but what you need is a good surface area two mating surfaces soft solder won't work on a say a butt joint it has to be a lap joint um we did one of the um suggestions perfectly reasonable suggestion was to silver solder a piece on as um as a butt joint which would work absolutely fine so let's just and this over, I think we want five millimeters. Let's just measure. Yeah, we want about five millimeters. So actually measure it this time rather than good old rule of thumb. So that wasn't particularly successful. Wolfie says, would the screws have been handmade for this clock? No, not in the sense of, um, of uh, sort of 18th century work. No, I mean, they would have been uh, made in their hundreds of thousands, I guess. So, but probably die plates, um, which we talked about on the 
live stream, didn't we? That's about five millimeters there. Um, so now what you could do is you could match the uh, thread. Because I've got one screw using our screw plates. And I think we looked at those on the live stream for the, um, the long case clock pendulum. Um, actually here, I'm gonna probably be use BA, which is based on a metric system anyway. Um, something like that. Not really thought this through which um, So that's one of those folds there. So that is gonna need folding right right down, isn't it? Yes, it is, Matthew. Need to fold that right down. Was that thing of the Daylon GS hypo cement to hold the glass? It was GS hypo cement. Yes, it was. Can you get it in the States or Canada? Is it available there? Can somebody tell us? Get it in Great. As long as you can get it in Canada, everybody's happy. Um, it's useful. And it also seems to last ages in that bottle as well, which is slightly surprising. So I'm just going to fold this again, straighten it up. Obviously, we might want to. Um, take a little bit more time over this, do it a bit neater, but hey ho. Again, the beauty of using CZ108, it's a pig to file. Uh, you didn't see the sewing, but it's like sewing through kind of chewing gum that's uh, stuck on the sidewalk. Um, but the beauty is it doesn't crack when you bend it. Like that's really good at cold working. So we've now got our new um, end. Let's have a look. There we are. Can hardly tell the difference, can you? Uh, once filing down a little bit. Um, I did notice on the other side, the reason why it's broken off both sides have started to crack actually. So this is where um, we would tidy it up a little bit more, but I'm just going to, um, oh, we've got like two minutes, just going to very quickly demonstrate the soft soldering if you haven't seen it before, not on this uh, old bezel, but on the inside of this strap. So please bear with us. I know some people have got to be way on time tonight because in the UK, there's a very important football match starting at eight o'clock. And no doubt we want to get a front row seat with a crisps and beer or whatever it is. Tom says, why not drill when flat and then bend? It's through, it goes through two uh, bits of metal. It's not just one, otherwise that would make complete sense. So you've got to fold it, it's folded. Uh, the original one's folded. So um, uh, you couldn't do, you couldn't line up the two holes. Uh, but yeah, it's a good point. Um, but you could also just solder on a block of material on the inside of the strap. Uh, as well, which would be a perfectly reasonable thing to do and actually kind of a bit easier. So I'm going to tidy this up and uh, we'll have to finish the, uh, the job next week, but very quickly, let's just always addictive filing and making things, um, making things smart. So getting there. Once filing and tidying and so on, well, let's just super quickly solder it. So remember our three rules of soldering. I'm going to cut it probably about that long and then bevel the end of it. But let's just solder here super quick. If you've got to go watch the football, I totally understand. I won't be offended. So three rules of soldering. We've been through this on their live stream now. So the one number one rule of soldering the surfaces must be clean, uh, which is why you use flux. You've got to clean things up first. Now, this is new material, so I can file away at it to my heart's content. Um, I'm not going to file the old bit 
uh, but I will have to clean it. So I'll just use a bit of four knots steel wool. Let's just put a bit of a bevel on there, like that. Second rule of soldering, you've got to have somewhere for the solder to go. Now, in this case, it's dead simple because we're going to tin both sides, which basically means putting a really thin layer of solder on first uh, as the two components individually. Then we're going to put them together, we're going to reheat it, and then they're going to go and solder together. It's going to be absolutely brilliant. So in the meantime, let's get our solder. I said looking around for his. So usual story. Derek said he'd rather watch you than the football. Oh, that's very sweet, Derek. Thank you. Uh, there are very few people who would rather watch me than the football. At least you know who's going to win on this competition. It's always going to be the clocks and never me. But anyway. So again, clean the solder, get totally sort of obsessed about cleanliness. So here's a bit of flux that we're gonna spread out. We did this, I can't remember what we did it with, but we've done it with a few things now. Um, I need a bit, of a bit of brass wire just to spread out the solder. So rather than putting an enormous blob on, what I advise you to do is just to cut a small piece off with a scalpel, put it on there, then you've got a control one of the um, sort of one of the curses of soft soldering is that people get the solder like this, and I've done it myself, and you put more and more and more, and it's like really satisfying. Um, but all that happens then is that you end up with big blobs of solder, and it gets gives soft soldering a bad name. Anyway, we're going to try and. Um, be subtle about this in the closing minutes. So my list, which has disappeared, we've got silvering coming up, fusey clock springs coming up. Uh, we've got this um, amazing new project we started on the Facebook page today, which is again a kind of community or a wiki uh, construction of a handout for um, people who buy a clock on the internet or something like that. And they say, can I get this clock running? Uh, things like putting it in beat and so on. But also advises people to consult a professional clock maker if that's uh, what's required. So that's cool. We're doing it through Google Documents. And um, yeah, it's been uh, pretty heavy going so far, but so far so good. So I am just gonna touch it with the solder rather than cut a piece off. Using my spirit lamp, there we are. And then a bit of brass, and we can just spread it out like that. There we are, tin that. So you can imagine, uh, I'll do finish it next week on the, oh, sorry, on the other component. See, that's actually worked really well. You can see with the light, there we are. Tin that surface. Um, spread out the uh, spread out the solder. So with the other component, I'm going to do the same thing. We'll do that next week very quickly. Join them together, and then our repair will be done. So I can tidy that up a bit now. So uh, thank you for your patience, as always. Um, if you've been involved in writing or not, or want to get into writing, uh, please check out this project on the Facebook page because it's hopefully going to be really cool. Um, it'll it'll end up as kind of like a six page handout maybe a bit more than that and uh, anybody can join in and contribute to it and then hopefully that will be a good encouragement for people not only to seek out professional clockmakers when they need it but also maybe to think about taking a more formal um program of education as well so um there we go um thank you uh for the facebook member who posted the picture of the french clock Thank you to Team Open Clock Club. I've been typing away in the corner there. Brilliant. And uh, if we don't see you on Thursday for the live, live stream, then we'll see you holding well next Saturday for the next installation of Open Clock Club. And have a brilliant weekend. Uh, bye for now. Thank you.